The book of Hebrews says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. I'd like to talk a little bit about today about God. And I would like to talk about the nature and person of God. What do I mean by the nature and person of God? I mean that God is a personal being. I mean that God is who he is and not who we want him to be. The word God is often, just these days, just thrown around. In some people's minds, when they say God, they're not speaking the name of a deity. They're not invoking the person of a deity. They're just using a word that they use when they get frustrated. And the same is true when they say Jesus Christ. Often Jesus Christ is nothing more to them than a byword. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. I want to talk about God, this God that people just, the word they just throw around. Because there are some things I want to make clear about this God. As I mentioned, I want to talk about the fact that God is a personal being. What does that mean? God is a personal being. It means that he's a person. And because he is a person, that means we can and must know him personally. I understand the fact that this God I say that I serve, I say he spoke existence into being. I say that this God said, let there be light, when there was no such thing as light. And when he said, let there be light, there it was, and it was perfect, and it was good. And I understand that as a human being, a finite human being, there's only so much I can really know about this God. There's only so much that I can grasp and comprehend. You see, as a Christian, I believe that this God exists in three persons. Three persons, one essence, totally unified in the person of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, I just read to you the first three verses of the book of Hebrews, and I believe that this kind of sets the tone for what I want to say in this video. You see, a while back, I was listening to some um, older people talking to children, and this older lady asked this young boy, she says, she said to him, well, who is Jesus to you? And I kind of cringed at that. And I cringed at that because there's something we have to realize. That Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. And being a person who existed in time and space, who he is, is not open to personal interpretation. What do I mean by that? We all understand things differently. You can have an accident and have five different people tell you the exact same thing, but they see things and they understand things a little differently than each other. So if you ask each five of them to explain what they saw, they will give a slightly different picture. But they will all agree on the essence. They will all agree on, the de on, on many of the details how they felt about the details, what they think about the details, are irrelevant. The fact is there was an accident and these five different people saw it. The same is kind of true for Jesus. This is why we have four Gospels. Mark explained him one way, Matthew explained him one way, Luke explained him one way, and John explained him one way. But the reality is they were all explaining the same person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when 
the lady asked that boy, who is Jesus to you? I wanted to say it doesn't matter who Jesus is to him. Jesus is who he is. And you see, I believe that as a Christian, it is my duty to know Jesus, not as I wish him to be, not as I think him to be, but as he knows himself to be. You see, when I say God is a person, that means that I can know him personally. Yes, he is vast. He is beyond human comprehension, this God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, there are things that he has told us explicitly in his word. Things that are not open to negotiation. You see, we can argue on a lot of things when it comes to understanding the word of God. But there are certain things that we cannot argue. That no matter how we feel about it, no matter how we see the world, no matter what we say is irrelevant. And I'll tell you why. Yes, God has mercy on us in all of our differences. God understands that all of us have our own worldview where we tend to focus on one thing and we overlook another thing. And that is true for how we deal with each other. But the point of this video is there is an abuse to that. There is a notion in today's society that God is whatever I want him to be. That God is whatever I need him to be. And I've even heard Christian pastors say that, and they shouldn't. Because God is not whatever I need him to be. He meets my needs, but he is not whatever I need him to be. He is who he is. And it is incumbent upon me, as a man who calls upon him, to know him as he knows himself. And that is possible. That is possible because he himself is the one revealing who he is. You see, this is why the personal notions of God only go so far. And it has to be said that this God who has revealed himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this God, as the book of Hebrews says, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets. <coughs> Excuse me. He may have spoken in different ways in times past, at different times, to the fathers through the prophets. But at no point in time did he ever contradict himself when he spoke to Isaiah. He did not contradict himself the way he spoke to Hosea, the way he spoke to Obadiah, the way he spoke to Elijah, the way he spoke to Moses. There is no conflict in the nature of and the personality that God revealed himself when he talked to Elisha than what he did when he talked to John the Baptist. What do I mean by that? I mean, yes, he spoke in different times, in different manners, but he did not speak differently. So what does that mean? That means that God never revealed himself to the Arabs as Allah. God never revealed himself to the Indians in India as Vishnu or Krishna. At no point in time did God ever become the person known as Siddhartha Gautama. At no point in time did God ever come to the American Indians and reveal himself as a great spirit, the great spirit, in the way that they understand him, being a being who is over other gods that you may worship. You see, this is the nature of God being a person. That means he is who he is, and he will not contradict himself when he speaks to one man and then turn around and say contradictory things about himself to another man. In fact, not only does God not contradict himself when he speaks about himself, but God never contradicts himself when he says anything about anything. This is much deeper than the need for us to understand God in our own context. This is, never mind our context, God is who he is. Let me say it like this. This God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
who has revealed himself in these last days in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. The Father is God. Jesus Christ, the Son, is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. This one being is God. And it does not matter how my culture influences my view of him because he is who he is, because he is a person. Let me put it to you like this. Some people who see this video know my father, Bob Allen. So all of you can agree when I say that Bob Allen, my dad, is a five foot two Asian man who lives in Tokyo. And what he does for a living is he washes windows in the business district of Tokyo on all the high rises. That's his job. That's what he does. He washes windows. And in the evenings, he performs in a heavy metal band called Peaceful Noises Made with Jackhammers and Chainsaws. And on the weekends, what he does for fun is he digs for gold in his backyard because he doesn't want to wash windows every day of his life. Now, that's my dad, Bob Allen, right? No, that isn't my dad. Well, those of you who know Bob Allen, you'll say, that's crazy. That's not the Robert Hutton Allen I know. I don't know who that guy is talking about. I personally know Bob Allen. And that's not Bob Allen. Bob Allen is not a five foot two Asian guy living in Tokyo, Japan. Well, well, th that's what Bob Allen is to me. That's what I want Bob Allen to be. But the people who know him are saying, there may be some guy named Bob Allen out there like that, but that's not the Robert Hutton Allen that I know. And that's not the Robert Hutton Allen that is Bill Allen's father. But... I insist that that's the Bob Allen that I want. But it doesn't matter what I want. But that's, that's who Bob Allen is to me. And those of you who know him are saying, that's nuts. And I can say that's nuts because I personally know him. And that's not Bob Allen. Now let me ask all of you, if that is true for my earthly father, that he is not that way that I just painted him. That that picture that I just drew for you is not accurate. And it is not Bob Allen. Well, why can't you just live and let live and let me have the Bob Allen I want? Well, because it's not Bob Allen. That is not my father. And if that is true for my earthly father, why do we suppose that it's okay to do that, to paint that false, subjective, irrational picture of my heavenly father. If that's okay, if that's not okay to do about a human that we know, that we can verify, that we can check up on, why do we suppose that God can be whatever we want him to be? That who Jesus is to me is legitimate. Jesus is who he is. And I want to talk about this Jesus. I want to talk about this God who is who he is. Now, I understand that in any video that I make and put on YouTube and Facebook is going to be limited. And I understand that I am a limited human being with faults and failures of my own. And I understand that every single one of us come to God with misconceptions with emphases. For example, some of us like to view God as holy. You see, because God is holy. And that's something that we need to understand about this person called God. He is holy. What is holiness? What is holy? It means that there is nothing morally wrong with him. It means that he does not imagine evil in his heart. That means he is not a lustful being. It means that he is not one who desires pain and confusion. He is not one who enjoys the 
wrongness of this world. He, in fact, is pure. He, in fact, is true in everything that is outside of his nature, that it contradicts his nature, is wrong because he is the standard. This holiness means that he is not wrong, he will not do wrong, and he cannot abide wrong. Wrong, by the way, is what he calls wrong. And he can call wrong, wrong, and it be wrong because he is God. Therefore, he has the right, the power, and the authority to define what is wrong. Not me. You see, I just painted a wrong picture of Robert Hutton Allen, of Bob Allen, my dad. And I did it on purpose. Because I wanted to make the point that he's not whatever I want him to be. He is who he is because the experiences he's had in his life, the things he has gone through in his life, the things that he has done, the thoughts that he has thought, the relationships that he has had, the experiences, the daily living that he has had has made him the man who he is. And that is not subject to my interpretations. How I view him is irrelevant to how he is. And the absolute same is true about God. He is holy. And even if my emphasis is that he is holy, does not change this fact that someone else might not emphasize the fact that he is holy. And the fact that they do not emphasize the fact that he is holy does not alter the truth. He is holy. You see, it talks about many times in the Bible, I, the Lord, am holy, therefore be ye holy. That brings up another aspect of God, of his personality. He is holy. It also means that he is righteous because he says, I am holy, therefore be ye holy. And as I said, he has the right, being God, to set the standards and to define the terms. He is righteous, meaning that he will not do wrong in his dealings with you, in his dealings with me. That doesn't mean that he always deals with us the way we want him to. This brings into play the idea that you know, there are people who say that they don't believe God exists. I think that that's rare, if it's true at all. And I think that most people actually do believe that God exists. They only don't want him to exist. And they don't want him to exist because every time they've dealt with him, he has behaved in a manner that did not fit their expectations. You see, when we have this idea that God is whoever we want him to be, that means that God must perform to our standards, to our expectations. And the holiness of God and the righteousness of God shuts that down. That means that we must act according to His standards. That means regardless of how we feel about Him, He is right. And just because we don't understand or don't want Him to behave in the manner we think He should behave, does not alter the fact that He will do what's right. Someone may say, well, I prayed to him for healing, and I'm still sick. Or I prayed to him to heal a loved one of mine, my, my grandmother. And I prayed and I believed that he would heal her, and she died anyway. That's hard. And that hurts. But let me explain it to you like this. Our God does whatsoever he pleases. That's a hard pill to swallow. Well, if he loved me, ah, and that's another aspect of God that we're going to talk about, love. Well, if God loved me, he wouldn't have let my grandmother die. Did your grandmother trust him? Yes, my grandmother trusted him, and she died anyway. Well, where is she? She's with him. She's in his presence, enjoying his beauty seeing him and being seen by him face to face. 
Yes, God loves your grandmother. And yes, God let her die. But it wasn't because he didn't love you and it doesn't, isn't because he didn't love her. It's because men die. It's because things fall apart. Why do things fall apart? Because man sinned. Because the first man and the first woman took it upon themselves to disobey God, even though he warned them what would happen when they did. And therefore, every single one of us are trapped. We are trapped in this thing called sin. You see, I say that God is holy and God is righteous. And these are aspects of his personality that are not open to discussion. They are not open to debate. Now, some of us may have an idea of what his holiness is or isn't. And we may argue about that. But the fact is, it is true and it is not up for debate. He is holy and he is righteous. And when man and woman said, I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to be a God in my own right. Then the consequences was death. You see, God said, the soul that sins shall die. And every single one of us have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now remember, this is the word of God. This is the word of God. Yes, he used the Apostle Paul to write those words. But it does not alter the fact that God told Paul what to write. Therefore, when God says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we understand that there's a problem. And God is holy and God is righteous. And he sets the standards. And he said, the soul that sins shall die. And every single soul has sinned. Ah, but didn't I just say that God is love? Yes, I did. What is love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life, but have everlasting life. God is love. What does that mean? That means that this holy, righteous God who demands death, yes, he does, demands death for breaking his righteous commands because he's God and he knows what's best and he has the right to say what is best. Has declared that the one who disobeys him may not be with him. God loves you. This righteous, holy God loves you. Therefore, something had to be done about the sin. Sin has to be punished. But in punishing sin, the soul that sins must die. Therefore, there is a separation. God did not want that separation. And in his love, he made a way. He made a way for the sinning soul to be reconciled, to be made justified, to be made pure and clean again. The soul who wandered away by choice and by birth. I've said this in other videos before, and I'll probably say it again. Because we must understand that God is love. And this love means that he is reaching out to us because he himself took on human form. God the Father, God the Son. God the Son came and took upon himself human flesh when he was born through the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. God took on himself the likeness of sinful flesh. What does it say in the book of Romans, chapter 8? There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh here's the point I want us to look at God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that we might have the righteousness of the law who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit 
God sending his own son, God loving you so much that he knew something had to be done about sin and that you and I could not do it ourselves. This is love, that he loves us and he is doing something about this, about this separation. You see, it's important to God that we not go away from him. And this coming, this incarnation, that God the Son, that Jesus Christ, the second person of this Trinity Godhead, taking upon himself human form. Jesus did certain things when he was here. He taught us who God was through his teachings. He showed us the nature, the personality, and the character of God by his own nature, personality, and character. And he became the sacrifice for sin. You see, Jesus never did wrong. When I say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, there is truly only one exception to that in the entire annals of human history, and that was the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is fully, completely, 100% human being. He is our example. He is our standard. He is the one that we look to when we want to see, how should I as a human being live my life? I look at Jesus Christ. I look at those who emulate him through the power of the Holy Spirit. But he is the primary source of our example. But he did more than just come to teach us. He did more than just come to be an example. He came to die for us. And when he did, he died on the cross. He suffered because every bit of the wrath of God directed righteously towards sin and evil and iniquity. Every wrong thing that I did, that you did, that every single human being who ever lived and ever will live, was placed upon Jesus Christ on that cross. And God the Father turned his back on God the Son. And Jesus cried on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a mystery. I can no more explain the Trinity than an ant can, the quantum theory of quantum mechanics. There is no way I can do that. But by faith... I understand that it is so. Somehow, this inseparable triune person, known as God, revealed himself as three distinct persons in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And on that cross, God the Son died. He offered himself up through the Holy Spirit. Now, when I say that God the Son came and taught, and showed things about God. What does that say? That says that Jesus Christ is who he is also. Just as the Father is who he is, and not whoever I want him to be. Jesus Christ, the Son, is also who he is, and not who I wish him to be. You see, God is love. Therefore, Jesus Christ is love. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is compassionate. Jesus Christ is merciful. Jesus Christ got angry. Jesus Christ got upset with his disciples for their hard-heartedness, for their lack of faith. Jesus Christ grew frustrated. What does that mean? That means he's not whatever I want him to be. That means he is who he is, and he has a distinct personality apart from my whims. So for those who ask the question, who is Jesus to you? Let me tell you something. It doesn't matter. He is who he is, and he is revealed in the word of God. And it's necessary that we understand that he revealed himself in the word of God. Jesus Christ is the living word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And it's, un it's necessary for us to understand that because we need to understand that in order for us to really have fellowship with him, that we cannot just make stuff up about him and expect it to be true and expect it to be accurate. You see, 
Many people will stand before Jesus on the day of judgment and say, Did I not cast out demons in thy name? Did I not do many miraculous works in thy name? Did I not do this and did I not do that? Jesus will say, Depart from me, I never knew you. And this is important for us to understand when we understand the person and the nature of God as far as it goes as God being a person with a distinct personality. Jesus said, I never knew you. This is what he will say in the future to many. That implies he can be known personally. That means that we can know him personally. Therefore, he is not whatever I want him to be. And here's something else that it tells me about him. He wants to know us. I do not get the picture from Scripture that God enjoys sending people to hell. In fact, my understanding of Scripture says God doesn't send anyone to hell. What happens is we decide we want to do our own thing to the point where we reject Him. And He will not force Himself upon us. He will truly let us go our own way. And that's because He loves us. You see, this holiness, this righteousness, does not cancel his love. But his love does not cancel his holiness and his righteousness. You see, we understand that Jesus is that compassionate, merciful, loving, great teacher. But we also understand that he is the judge of the ages. That Jesus said, I do not judge you. I do not condemn you. My blood the word that I have spoken, Moses, the word of God, your rejection of me and what I have done is what will be the basis of your judgment. You see, he took the penalty of sin. But that does not mean that, that it is indiscriminately applied to humanity just because. We have to accept it. We have to ask it for it. We have to believe him. And that's all it takes. You see, this idea that God is who he is means that we must approach him on his terms. And here's an audacious statement on my behalf. I have the audacity to tell you that his terms are very clear, very simple, and very easy. His terms for receiving the salvation and getting to know him personally are very simple and that is you must believe him for you are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God God is offering you this gift of eternal life of salvation of eternal joy of peace of grace and mercy and goodness and and bliss forever in his presence in indescribable grandeur and beauty. This gift that all we have to do is ask Him for it and believe Him that He will give it to us. Those are the standards. That is the terms. It is after that, it is after we have accepted this gift that He wants us to go on, to mature, to know Him, to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, to minister to others. But first, we must simply accept Him. You see, this is a hard thing for people who do not know Him, because it's too good to be true. But this is the standard, and this will not change the fact. All you have to do is ask Him, for his help. All you have to do is ask him for his mercy and he'll give it to you. You see, in order to know him, in order to be known by him, in order to know who he is according to what he says, all you have to do is ask him, show yourself to me and believe him that he will. You see, some people have this idea that they say, okay God, if you're real, just open up the heavens, reveal yourself to me, I'll give you five minutes. And when he doesn't do it the way he 
you know, the way they think he should do it. I say, you see, it's not so. You must accept God on his terms, not your terms. Because God is not what you want him to be. God is not what I want him to be. I cannot call him a name that is not his name and expect him to honor that. I cannot have notions about him that are erroneous to the point where I'm making stuff up about him. As I said, I'm human. And there are very likely aspects of God's nature and personality that I don't understand as fully as I ought to after all these years of walking with him. And he is helping me. And he will help you. At the same time, that does not give me the freedom just to make stuff up and say, that's the God I want. That's the God I need. That's the God I deserve. That's the God I, I serve. No. God is not some being like a genie that has to grant your wishes because you did the magic thing. God does not have to stoop to your standards or my standards. We must conform to his standards. You see, this God who is love, this God who is righteous, this God who is holy, this God has a very distinct personality that is not your personality. God is not an extension of your higher self, whatever that means. God is not just an aspect of your own nature. You are not God. God is not you. Pantheism is not accurate. It is not true. It is not real. And the adverse of pantheism isn't true, accurate, or real either. You are not God. You are not a God. Never mind what the New Agers say that they have no proof for. They say that we are God. Well, then why don't we change this world? Why don't we make this world a better place? If I was God, I could override. Well, you can't override God. God cannot. Then there's a big problem. The fact is, God is who he is, not who we want him to be. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. Who is the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Let me tell you something. God is not a man that he should lie nor the Son of Man, that he should repent. God does not change. He's not going to tell Moses one thing, and Isaiah something else, John the Baptist something yet different, Paul the Apostle something different, and he's not going to tell you something different. I have to say it like this, and it's hard, but it doesn't matter what your feelings about it are. Oh, but I love this person. Love does not make it right. Oh, but I want this. And because I want this, it's okay. Your covetousness does not alter God's stand on something. But my opinion, your opinion is not valid when it comes to the nature and the personality of God being who he is. God does not change. He's not a man that he should lie, or the Son of Man, that he should repent. And Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is who he is. And if you want to know him, and if you want to serve him, then the thing you must understand is, you must do it on his terms. And his terms are, that you ask him, show yourself to me. Show me who this Jesus is. Come to me. I will accept you. I will put aside what I want. I need your forgiveness because you, being God, 
have said that I have fallen short of your glory. And because you're God, that's true and that's accurate and that's right. You see, the Holy Spirit is God too. And he's the comforter. And he's the paraclete. He's the helper. He's the one who comes along beside of us and pulls us to Jesus Christ. And pulls, he comes alongside of us and reveals who Jesus is. Not who we want him to be, but who he is. And yes, there are a lot of bugs that will need to be ironed out and will not be ironed out until the day we all see him face to face. But we have to start somewhere. And this is the place to start with asking him, show me who you are in spite of who I want you to be.